You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. What's something you learned in history class that you feel like wasn't the whole truth? Better yet, what's something you didn't learn at all that was omitted completely? That's what I like to call redacted history. My name is Andre White, the host of the Redacted History Podcast, the place where history's forgotten events, heroes, and villains get their story told, one episode at a time. The Redacted History Podcast. Real history never dies. Stream the Redacted History Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. While quietly awaiting developments, we heard the sound of a horse's hooves, and as a courier galloped up to General Jackson to announce Longstreet's approach, the cloud of red dust raised by his vanguard in the direction of Thoroughfare Gap assured us that he would soon be at hand. Before he reached the field, however, and while we were enjoying the sense of relief at his coming, one of the enemy's batteries had, quietly and unobserved, managed to get into one of the positions occupied by our battery during the morning. Their first volley, coming from such an unexpected quarter, created a great commotion. Instantly, we galloped to their front and unlimbered our guns at close range. Each man worked as if success depended on his individual exertions, while Captain Pogue and Lieutenant Graham galloped back and forth among the guns, urging us to our best efforts. Our antagonists got our range at once, and with their 12-pound Napoleons, poured in a raking fire. One shell I noticed particularly as it burst and waited a moment to observe its effects as the fragments tore by. One of them struck Captain Pogue's horse near the middle of the hip, from which spurted a stream of blood. To dismount before his horse fell required quick work, but the captain was equal to the occasion. Another shell robbed Henry Bottler of the seat of his trousers, but caused the shedding of no blood, although the loss was a serious one. Eugene Alexander of Moorfield had his thigh bone broken. Sergeant Henry Payne, a splendid man and accomplished scholar, was struck by a solid shot just below the knee and his left leg hanging by shreds of flesh. An hour later, when being lifted into an ambulance, I heard him ask if his leg could not be saved, but in another hour he was dead. Private Edward A. Moore, Rockbridge Artillery, Tolliver's Division. In the midst of this slaughter, Milroy came to the writer, and with all the enthusiasm of his nature, said, Major Lang, now is the opportunity for you to distinguish yourself. I want you to charge the railroad embankment just in front of our position and see what is behind it. There was but one reply to such a command, and that was to charge. While arranging the companies, an incident in illustration of premonition of death on the battlefield was forcibly presented to me. Captain David Gibson of Company H approached me with a face as calm and spiritual as if he had been preparing for the march to the altar, and said to me, Major, I shall be killed in this charge. I endeavored to quiet his apprehensions in some by-play of pleasant words, but he did not heed them, but forcibly said, I tell you, I am going to be killed in this charge. I knew it last night. I have known it all morning. The captain was as brave a man as ever drew a sword, but on this occasion his voice and manner were so changed that I begged him not to make the charge, but he would not listen to that. So the charge began, out of the wood, across the field, and before we had passed half the distance, a bullet struck him in the forehead, and brave Captain Gibson fell dead, face to the foe. The charging column continued, only a few scattered shots from the railroad met our advance until we were within 150 feet of the embankment, when immediately a torrent of bristling muskets poured over the embankment and sent such a crash of leaden hail into our ranks that we beat a hasty retreat, leaving many of our men dead and wounded on the field. We had met Stonewall Jackson's own command. Major Theodore F. Lang 3rd West Virginia Infantry, Milroy's Brigade.
Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to episode 177 of our Civil War podcast. I'm Rich. And I'm Tracy. Hello y'all. Welcome to the podcast. We used the last episode to look at the fight at Bronner's Farm, which took place on the evening of Thursday, August 28, 1862. That short but extremely violent clash between part of Stonewall Jackson's command and elements of Urban McDowell's Third Corps is generally considered the opening round of the Second Battle of Manassas. And as we usually do with each major battle that we cover here on the podcast, we want to encourage you to pull out your Civil War atlas so that, map in hand, you can better follow the action as it unfolds. If you picked up the Echoes of Glory, Illustrated Atlas of the Civil War by Time Life, which we've recommended previously, then you get quite a bit of coverage of the campaign and battle, 12 pages, and that includes six excellent maps. As y'all recall, after Stonewall Jackson withdrew from Manassas Junction on the night of August 27th, John Pope had lost track of him. But then the fight at Bronner's Farm the next evening let Pope know exactly where Stonewall was. Jackson had marched his men to the old Bull Run battlefield. Stonewall Jackson had been found, and once again John Pope was determined to trap and destroy him. But as we said at the end of the last show, Pope, in a fateful error of judgment, was so fixated on Jackson that, remarkably, he continued to almost willfully ignore Robert E. Lee and James Longstreet's approach with 30,000 new Confederate troops. And instead, Pope chose to believe that Longstreet would not, could not, interfere with his plans to defeat Stonewall. But whether John Pope admitted it or not, in a few hours, the two wings of Lee's army would be reunited and would be poised for the crowning move of Robert E. Lee's great gamble. Hey y'all, spooky season is here, and if you're looking for a show to whet your appetite for a little haunted history, then I'd like to invite you to check out Southern Gothic, a chart-topping history podcast that explores some of the most infamous legends, folklore, ghost stories, and hauntings of the American South. We've covered all sorts of stuff from the Bell Witch of Tennessee to the disappearance of the Confederate submarine, the H.L. Hunley. Not to mention our deep dives into the local lore of some of America's oldest and most haunted cities like New Orleans, Charleston, and St. Augustine. So, if you're ready for a little good old-fashioned Halloween storytelling with a commitment to quality historical research, then be sure to check out Southern Gothic today. It's available now on all your favorite podcast apps. History never says goodbye. It just says, see you later. Edward Galliano was right when he said that. Events keep happening over and over again in some form. And that's the reason I produced the podcast, My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. What is it? We take stories of history and apply them to the events of today to help you perhaps understand them better. We are also part of Airwave Media Network. I've been doing the program since 2006. That's a long time, and the show has a long name. My history can beat up your politics. Find me wherever you get podcasts. John Pope was afraid that Stonewall Jackson might slip away again, so the Union commander spent the early hours of Friday, August 29th, trying to concentrate most of his command in the vicinity of the small hamlet of Groveton on the Warrenton Turnpike. Rufus King's division was ordered to retrace its steps from Manassas Junction, along with James B. Brickett's division, which had arrived following the fight at Thoroughfare Gap. Fitz John Porter's V Corps from the Army of the Potomac had also arrived at Manassas, and they would join Hatch's brigade and Ricketts in a movement toward Gainesville, where they would be in a position to sever Stonewall Jackson's line of retreat. Franz Siegel's I Corps and John Reynolds' Division of Pennsylvania Reserves would strike at Jackson's right and center, 
while from the Army of the Potomac, the IX Corps and Samuel Heinzelman's III Corps would move on Stonewall's left flank from their positions near Centerville. Stonewall Jackson knew that he had stirred up a hornet's nest with his attack at Bronner's Farm the night before, and he thought a federal assault on his position was likely on Friday. But he instructed his subordinates to avoid fighting a pitched battle as long as possible in anticipation of the arrival of Longstreet, whose troops were fast approaching from the west. On Friday morning, Jackson's command was firmly ensconced along Stony Ridge and the line of the unfinished railroad on the northwestern edge of the old battlefield. A.P. Hill's division was on the left, Dick Yule's in the center, and W.B. Tolliver's on the right, near the Warrenton Turnpike, where Longstreet would make his appearance. And because Yule and Tolliver had both been wounded at Bronner's Farm, Yule's division was now under the command of Alexander Lawton, and Tolliver's was being led by William E. Stark. Much is usually made of Jackson's use of the unfinished railroad line to anchor his position, but on close inspection, the railroad excavation, which Stonewall at first probably planned to use as a ready-made breastwork the entire length of his line, in reality provided an inconsistent and therefore vulnerable bulwark. That's because in some places the fills were too high and steep to be used, while elsewhere the cuts were too deep. In other places, the excavation amounted to nothing at all. It was just level ground. Probably for these reasons, Stonewall's line didn't precisely follow the unfinished railroad. The first Union threat came in late morning when Siegel's 9,000 men fanned out from their staging area on Henry Hill and moved west across a two-mile front. Two elements of Siegel's force tangled with Stonewall Jackson's line. Carl Schurz's division of Federals engaged Maxie Gregg's South Carolinians, who held a rocky crest on the rebel left, and Robert Milroy's brigade impetuously advanced across the Groveton Sudley Road to strike at a gap in the unfinished railroad line. While getting his men formed up for the assault, Milroy had told them, quote, Fall in, boys. We're going to whip them before breakfast. Despite Milroy's brave words, both Yankee attacks were thrown back, but Jackson's troops had been unavoidably drawn into a rapidly escalating battle. But to Stonewall's great relief, Lee and Longstreet appeared on the scene about 10 a.m., and the vanguard of Longstreet's column, John B. Hood's division, began deploying astride the Warrenton Turnpike on Stonewall's right. Robert E. Lee narrowly escaped death while reconnoitering the Union line when an enemy bullet grazed his cheek. The incident barely fazed the Confederate commander, though. Lee was supremely confident. The two wings of his army had been reunited, and he would soon have more than 50,000 men in position to blunt his opponent's continued assaults and possibly launch an attack of Lee's own. We got a strong position behind a railroad embankment, bought them about an hour and drove them back. Before a great while, they charged our position and flanked us at the same time. General Hill had sent a courier previous to that for us to get out from there, but we failed to get it. Our brigade fought like heroes, our regiment in the center. The first thing we knew, both wings had given away, and the 45th was nearly surrounded. The last fire I made, I stood on the embankment and fired right down amongst them, just as they were charging up the bank about 15 ranks deep. I turned and saw the whole regiment getting away, and I followed the example in triple quick time. They charged over the road and fired on us, but were met by Branch's brigade and were driven right back over it, about a mile the other side. I went to where I fired last, and three of the devils were lying there. I got me a good Yankee zinc canteen, which fortunately was nearly filled with water. Private Marion H. Fitzpatrick, 45th Georgia Infantry, Thomas's Brigade. Discovering that our regiment was alone and that the bullets began to come thick and fast from the rear, the colonel sent me back to see why the other two regiments did not follow us and to tell them they were firing upon us. As I approached the ditch, I heard loud cheering on the other side and thought we were about to be supported. But as a number of bullets whistled by my ears, I quickened my pace to inform them that we were ahead. 
Mounting the opposite side of the ditch, the, pull, the bullets flew by me so thick that I quickly jumped back again, and peeping up over the bank could hardly trust my eyes when I saw yellow legs standing as thick as wheat not more than twenty-five paces from the ditch. I instantly called to the regiment to retreat to the ditch, which was done at a run. Taking a second look to see if I could see a flag, I saw one, their battle flag, with a red cross worked in it, and a swarm of rebels following it at double-quick towards our left, so as to surround us. The colonel still doubted whether it could be rebels. He took our flag and waved it above the ditch. It was instantly riddled with bullets. Captain Henry H. Pearson, 6th New Hampshire Infantry, Nagel's Brigade. John Pope reached the battlefield about one o'clock on Friday afternoon. He was still single-minded in his determination to destroy Stonewall Jackson, and incredibly, he was still unaware of Longstreet's arrival on the scene. But by shortly after 12 o'clock noon, Longstreet was substantially deployed on Jackson's right. The Confederate line now extended for nearly three miles, with half of it Stonewall facing southeast and half Longstreet facing east. Shaped as it was like a huge pair of gaping jaws, the Confederate dispositions offered Robert E. Lee the opportunity to smash Pope's army. Jackson's line to the north would be the immovable upper jaw, while Longstreet's wing would be the movable mandible, capable of rolling forward and crushing the enemy. Along its entire length, Longstreet's position lay concealed by woods, while the ground between him and Bull Run, off to the east, was largely open. If Pope continued his current single-minded focus on Stonewall Jackson, then Longstreet would have Pope's unprepared left flank at his mercy. The only question confronting Lee would be when to send Longstreet forward to snap the jaws shut. While Lee was contemplating a crushing counterstroke against Pope, the Union commander relieved Siegel's bloody troops with elements of the 3rd and 9th Corps, and the fresh Federal units lashed out at Stonewall Jackson's position. At 3 p.m., Joseph Hooker ordered Cuvier Grover's 1,500-man brigade forward over the same ground Milroy had earlier failed to carry. Grover wise, wisely avoided the open terrain where Milroy had come to grief and sidled his five regiments northeastward in order to strike Jackson's line from the cover of woods adjoining the railroad grade. With the cheer, Grover's men launched a bayonet charge toward a cut in the unfinished railroad. It was a portion of the rebel line between Maxie Gregg's and Edward Thomas's brigades that was largely empty of defenders. Within minutes, Thomas's Georgians had given way, and Gregg was desperately striving to shift his South Carolinians to plug the Yankee breakthrough as Grover forged ahead. But no federal supports were forthcoming, and A.P. Hill was able to stem the enemy breakthrough with Dorsey Pender's brigade. With more than a third of his men down, Grover had no choice but to order a retreat. The next Union advance on the unfinished railroad grade came southwest of Grover's charge, where Colonel James Nagel led three regiments from the Ninth Corps against the portion of the Confederate line held by Lawton's division. Nagel's little brigade also penetrated the rebel position, but that initial success quickly gave way to disorderly retreat when Colonel Bradley T. Johnson's Virginia brigade slammed into Nagel's exposed left flank. Colonel Nelson Taylor's brigade of Hooker's division came up too late to help Nagel and was in turn thrown back, with two Confederate brigades in hot pursuit. A Federal artillery battery was nearly overrun and two guns were lost before Fighting Joe Hooker could restore order and repulse the rebel counterattack. It is not meant to say that the regiment got out of the woods in perfect order. The men were scattered some, in fact a great deal. Kearney was exceedingly anxious to promote those retiring near where he was. All engaged can remember the occasion well. Kearney riding in with his troops, the reins guiding his horse in his teeth, and sword in one hand, 
hissed through his clenched teeth, Fall in, you sons of a bitches, and I'll make major generals of every one of you. Some of the men under the lamented Gilmore returned to the fight with a Michigan regiment, but the commissions promised by Kearney never were forthcoming. Captain Oliver C. Bosbyshaw, 48th Pennsylvania Infantry, Nagel's Brigade. It was a fearfully long day. No one knows how much time can be crowded into an hour unless he has been under the fire of a desperate battle, holding on, as it were, by his teeth, hour after hour, waiting for a turning or praying that the great red sun, blazing and motionless overhead, would go down. Late in the afternoon, I had occasion to visit A.P. Hill. The last two attacks had been directed particularly against him, and the last of the two barely repulsed. One of his brigades was out of ammunition, and details were out on the field collecting cartridges from the boxes of the dead and wounded. He requested me to ride to General Jackson and explain the situation, and say if he was attacked again, he would do the best he could, but could hardly hope for success. Such a message from a fighter like Hill was weighty with apprehension. I quickly found the general and delivered the message. It seemed to deepen the shadow on his face, and the silence of the group around him was oppressive, but he answered promptly and sharply. Tell him if they attack him again, he must beat them. As I started off, he followed. We soon met General Hill on his way to General Jackson, and he repeated his fears. The general said calmly, General Hill, your men have done nobly. If you are attacked again, you will beat the enemy back. A rattle of musketry broke all along Hill's front. Here it comes, he said, and galloped off, Jackson calling after him. I'll expect you to beat them. The attack was fierce and soon over. The rebel yell seemed to follow and bury itself among the enemy in the wood, and we knew the result. A staff officer rode up and said, General Hill presents his compliments and says the attack of the enemy was repulsed. Tell him I knew he could do it, answered Jackson with a smile. Lieutenant Henry Kai Douglas, Staff, Major General Thomas J. Jackson. The largest federal attack of the day came at 5 p.m. when Pope directed Philip Kearney to lead his division against Stonewall Jackson's left. Kearney was called by one of his superiors, quote, the bravest man I ever knew, and a perfect soldier, end quote. The 47-year-old Phil Kearney was one of the most dynamic commanders in the Union Army, with a reputation for battlefield heroics. Despite inheriting great wealth, his only interest was soldiering, and he pursued it as a career with unflagging zeal. He fought with the French Army, secured a commission in the U.S. Army, and lost his left arm in the Mexican-American War, then served with the French Army again, leading a cavalry charge for which he was awarded the Legion of Honor. He returned to the United States when the Civil War broke out to fight for the Union, and he was one of the few bright stars in the Army of the Potomac during the Peninsula Campaign. But his performance here on August 29th had thus far been marred by a tardy march to the battlefield and his sullen unwillingness to cooperate with Siegel's earlier assaults. But now Kearney hurled ten regiments against a portion of Hill's line that had already been severely battered, and many of the rebel units were low on ammunition. Despite stiff resistance on their part, Gregg's and Thomas's brigades were driven from their position behind the unfinished railroad. On Kearney's left, two regiments from Isaac Stevens' division also managed to punch through the Confederate defenses. In response, Stonewall Jackson committed his only available reserves, Jubal Early's brigade, and yet again the Yankees were repulsed without being able to exploit their breakthrough. With night coming on, Pope was forced to call off his assaults on the Confederate left. He was baffled and angry that Fitzjohn Porter's expected attack against Jackson's right had failed to materialize. But in fact, Porter had only received contradictory and confusing orders from Pope on Friday, and while trying to implement them, he had run smack into an unexpected and large rebel force which had come up on Stonewall Jackson's right. This, of course, was Longstreet's command. 
Meanwhile, Urban McDowell had ordered Hatch's division to move west on the Warrenton Turnpike toward Groveton, where the movement of enemy troops and wagons appeared to confirm Pope's unwavering belief that Stonewall Jackson was trapped and his only thought was to get away. But instead of retreating rebels, Hatch's men collided with elements of Longstreet's newly arrived wing, and the completely surprised Federals found themselves locked in a confused fight that sputtered out in the darkness. It wasn't until 7 p.m. that the truth finally dawned on Pope. Finally willing to accept that Longstreet had arrived, Pope then woefully misjudged Robert E. Lee's intentions. In an amazing feat of wishful thinking, Pope convinced himself that Lee would merely feed Longstreet's men into Jackson's line, or else use the fresh troops to cover the withdrawal of the rebel army from the battlefield. It never occurred to John Pope that his left was in grave danger, that Lee would use Longstreet to extend the Confederate line southward, that the audacious enemy commander was contemplating an all-out decisive attack of his own the next day an attack that, if everything went as Lee planned, had the potential to crush Pope's army and drive the Yankees all the way back to Washington. That means it's time for this episode's book recommendation, and our recommendation this time is Return to Bull Run, The Campaign and Battle of Second Manassas by John J. Hennessy. We've already made reference to Hennessy's book several times uh, during our march up to the battle, and so we have no qualms about making it our recommendation for this episode. Return to Bull Run is a well-written, accessible, uh, that is, easily understandable, account of Second Manassas, and is generally considered the authoritative book on the campaign and battle. Don't forget you can find all of our book recommendations at the podcast website, which is www.civilwarpodcast.org. Also at the website, you can find links to the show's Facebook page and Twitter feed and find our contact information, too. And you can find information uh, about how to sign up to be a member of the Strawfoot Brigade and support the podcast in that way. In the next month or six weeks, we'll be hitting members episode number 50, which is kind of hard to believe uh, we're getting close to that number, uh, but it's great for you members of the Strawfoot Brigade, of course. And we're very happy to welcome quite a few new members this week. Paul, Lee, Tim, Kevin, and Spencer. Thanks, y'all. Yep, thanks, guys. And speaking of milestones with episodes, today is New Year's Day 2017, and it looks like we're on track to hit episode number 200 sometime this coming summer. Lord willing, and the crick don't rise. Uh, So that'll be pretty darn cool. Yep. Yep. Okay, so we'll look forward to episode 200, but thanks to all of you for listening to this episode of The Civil War, 1861 to 1865, a history podcast. Tracy and I do hope you'll join us next time when we look at the action on the third day of the Second Battle of Manassas. But until then, take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye.